Okay, so um, before we start the tutorial, this is just a little disclaimer. Um, this tutorial is really meant for people that use 3ds Max and want to get into Blender. Um, it's not really about teaching you the basics of Blender, it's kind of looking at how to set Blender up when it comes to preferences and other things to make it feel like 3ds Max, to make the transition of learning it um, a lot easier. So I've put up just a couple of really good resources on the basics of actually learning how to use Blender. Um, on the screen so if that's what you're looking for check that out um, and if you're just looking for you know if you're a Max guy and you want to see how you can set up Blender to make your learning experience a lot better then you know continue watching all right thanks hi there and welcome to this Blender 101 tutorial um, I'm not really going to be making anything uh, in Blender specifically today. I'm just going to run over some things you can set up, um, some defaults you could set up to make your life easier when you're coming from 3ds Max. Now before I get into it, some people might be wondering why Blender? Um, and for me it was kind of a, I don't know, I guess a journey through some other uh, software packages and uh, finding out which one I like best. Now I've used quite a few different things in the in the past. Um, I've used Maya here and there for a while. Uh, I used C4D when I started out in 3D for, for quite a bit. Um, and then I moved over to Max when I started working in a studio and that's what they used, so that's what I learned. And uh, I've been using it for a long time since. And I felt like it was time to, you know, I guess, extend the toolkit a little bit and add some more, um, add some new software into that. So I started playing around with some other applications as well. Um, I revisited Maya for a little bit. Uh, I played around with Modo, uh, tried the trial of that for a while. And um, after like this long, I guess, journey through other software packages, I ended up installing Blender. Um, I tried it, I guess, once or twice, maybe years ago. And um, I remember it being well, you know, kind of hard to get into, to be honest. And um, I thought, you know what? It's been a while now. I've got some more experience when it comes to 3D, so maybe the transition won't be as harsh. And um, honestly, since I've installed it a few months ago, I've been working with it a lot. Uh, I feel that in the last couple of years, it's become a really, really amazing application. Um, and some of the stuff it does, it almost does better than some of the other applications. Now, I'm not here to pick favorites. Um, you know, people saying what application, what 3D software package is, is best is just a discussion that I don't even want to get into because um, it doesn't really make sense. The best thing, um, you know, is the one that you're most comfortable using with. And at the end of the day, it's all about the art that you're making with it and not necessarily how you're doing it. Um, so for me, you know, good or bad, it's kind of objective when it comes to software. Um, I will mention though that with the current kind of pricing and licensing of a lot of the software packages out there these days, well, Blender obviously stands out because it, it's free. And, you know, a software package this good being free is kind of amazing when you think about it. Um, but anyway, I'm not going to preach too much about open source. Um, you know, you've seen me do some, some stuff with Natron as well. Uh, I really do like open source software. So Blender is definitely no exception. And uh, let's get into it. Let's see what it can, you know, give you a little, I guess, uh, if I can give you some insight into why I'm using Blender uh, while I'm setting this up and make your life a lot easier if you're coming from 3ds Max. So this is the start screen of Blender. And uh, you'll have a splash screen that opens with um, some stuff here. You can click donations, credits, uh, release log, other things. The Blender website and manual are quite helpful. And you've also got blenderartists.org to definitely check out um, because the people there are very friendly. They're very quick to help. And it's an awesome community all around, to be honest. Um, then we've got some recent files here. And to just click this away, you can click on it or anywhere beside it and it'll disappear. So let's have a quick look at the layout of the basic interface. Um, so first off, we've got our 3D view that should you know, come as a shock to anybody, seeing that it's a 3D application. Um, unlike Max, we don't, we're not greeted with a quad view, we're actually just thrown straight in, into perspective view. Now this is kind of my 
preferred way of working anyway, so I kind of like that. But there are options to go back to quad view if you want to. Um, but we'll just run through what's what's here. So I've got a little tools and create panel uh, on the side, which you can toggle by pressing the T key. So you'll see me hit T to toggle, toggle it on and off. Um, so then we've got the outliner over here. So what you would normally find in 3ds Max, uh, in the newer versions anyway, on the left side of your screen, is at the top right here. Um, you know, it's a different position, but it does the same thing. It shows your entire uh, scene with all your objects in it. Fun fact, you could actually have more than one scene within a single blend file. So that's kind of awesome if you think about it. Um, a lot of flexibility going on there. Then uh, here you have the, I don't know exactly what it's called, the properties panel, that's it. And um, here you have properties of all kinds of stuff. So the camera icon here will be render properties. You've got some world properties. Um, you've got some scene properties. So are you using metric or imperial unit? Imperial units or using just blender units things like that uh, These are your object properties Then we have constraints we can add so this is like, you know, if you go to max uh, What is it one of the menus the animation menu? I believe you add constraints Do the same thing over here in this panel. You've also got a bunch of modifiers as well So some similar workflow there to to 3ds max data operator. I'm just gonna pull this out a little bit um this is your material setup. Now, don't pay too much attention to this because we're going to change the renderer later. And uh, this will change a little bit in how it looks and what we do with it. Um, this is a texture panel. So in Blender, you can define textures separately from the uh, material just as you would in, let's say, a node view in Max, or the slate material editor, sorry, in Max. Um, but yeah, just good to know it's there. This is the particle system view. So if you want to add a particle system to a, an object, you could do that over here. Um, and this is the physics tab. And of course, Blender comes with some cool stuff built in like fluids and smoke and the usual soft body and rigid body uh, physics as well. So that's another option why I really enjoyed Blender. The fluid and smoke solvers are kind of cool. The fluid solver I've noticed is, you know, a little on the old side for, for, for basic stuff. It can do some cool things. Um, but the smoke solver especially is capable, is, you know, pretty damn capable. And, you know, again, you're getting all of this for free, so can't really complain. So let's get into the user preferences and see what I like to change about all this stuff. So in our file menu, we can find user preferences and we can start from the first tab. Let's start at the beginning and see what um, what we can change here. So there's a couple of things. I'm not going to run over every single one because um, obviously if you look at all these settings, there is quite a lot of them. Uh, and, you know, both of us will be bored out of our mind by the time I'm done. I'm just going to look at the ones that um, make Blender feel a little more like 3ds Max uh, so you can get into it a little easier. So the first thing I'm going to look at here is tooltips and Python tooltips. So um, obviously, when you're learning something, I would definitely leave the tooltips on. The Python tooltips are the little um, dark gray text under it. So if you want to start scripting in Blender, you can do that as well through Python um, within the interface. Uh, and it'll show you basically the Python command or, yeah, Python command or uh, I guess, yeah, Python call you'd have to use to program whatever is uh, whatever you're hovering over. So if you're not really into that yet and you want to keep it a little simpler, you can turn these off. And if you go over the tooltips and you'll see they've, they've gone. Um, just a little thing if you're not really into scripting and you know you don't want to clutter your interface, then that could be a really good thing to turn off. Then the other stuff, um, yeah, I generally don't really mess around with on this side. The prompt quit is definitely a good one. Um, as far as I know, this is only on Windows. So if you're trying to uh, close Blender and something change, it'll tell you, hey, you know, uh, changes have been made since your last save. Are you sure you want to quit? Um, this is not available on Linux, for example. I've been using Blender on Linux for a while now as well. And uh, it's definitely something to have. So I would leave that on for sure if you're using Windows. Then moving on, 
the uh, zoom to mouse position and rotate rotate around selection are definitely um, good things to turn on. So if we're going to zoom in here, you'll see that uh, it mimics the behavior of the newest 3ds Max versions, where you would um, zoom to zoom in and out to where your cursor is located. So let's go back to our Blender user preferences here. Um, also, rotate around selection is something that I really like using. Uh, this means that you just be rotating around the selected object. So if you've got this cube selected, we'll be rotating around that. If we've got this light selected, you'll be rotating around that. Um, again, this is something that uh, has changed here and there over the years as well in 3ds Max. I know some people like that behavior, other people don't. I like enabling it, so that's why I'm showing it to you. Um, and to be honest, that's pretty much it for this menu. Then moving on to the editing tab, um, I don't really change much about this. Uh, like I said, um, I think a lot of the defaults in Blender are actually pretty nice. The only two things that I might think are interesting for people getting into it, uh, just you know, at the beginning, is the allow negative frames. So normally when you play back, um, it'll start at one or zero and it won't uh, allow playing back from negative frames as the name suggests. Um, if you're used to you know, 3ds Max uh, behavior where you can go negative without it being any issue, you might wanna turn allow negative frames on. So that's a good one to uh, definitely mess around with um, and see what you like, you know, what you prefer. Then, um, the undo as well is you've got global undo, which is kind of, you know, as it, as it says, global undo works by keeping a full copy of the file of itself in memory, so it takes extra memory. It's kind of crazy, but if you have a lot of memory, then you know you could make it work. Also, you can set up an insane amount of steps and then a memory limit as well. Um, I found that the defaults work just fine for me. Uh, I usually, you know, hit save as or whatever uh, if I want to really start messing around with things, but it's good to know. Um, again, the last thing I guess in here as well is what do you prefer when you're making, uh, when you're keyframing things? Do you prefer just linear keyframes or Bezier keyframes? Now the uh, default behavior in Max is Bezier as well, so you can just leave that to the default if that's what you're used to. I kind of like working with linear. Um, I usually just do my keyframes first very quickly and then I start easing afterwards. I find it, you know, it's just my way of working. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm not saying it's better or worse, it's just what I do, so. Um, then let's move on to the input tab. So the input tab uh, is, I guess, one thing that Blender is kind of um, known for. Um, the thing is, when you start first start working with Blender, the weird thing about it is you right-click to select. So um, unfortunately, it's not showing it on my uh, overlay, but I'm right-clicking every single time. So if I left-click, you'll see the 3D cursor move, which is another weird little thing uh, when you start using Blender. It's different than other programs, but it's actually, when it comes down to it, it's quite handy because you're able to place things in 3D um, very quickly, and uh, it has to do with snapping objects and things like that as well. But just to select things, you're right-clicking all the time. Um, and when you get into these user preferences, you might say, hey, select with left is an option here. I'll hit it, and then I'll just start using left click to select everything. And um, I'll be honest, when I first started using Blender, <clears throat> the first, like, I guess, week or two weeks, I was setting this to select with left, and you've got a whole bunch of presets here, uh, 3ds Max preset as well, for example, and when it comes to viewport navigation, 3ds Max preset as well. And you might be really tempted to just say, hey, I'm gonna hit the 3ds Max presets and you know, so you start using it. And while that is you know, maybe a good idea to get into it the first week or two, what I found is if you're starting to use all these different presets, um, then every single tutorial you're gonna find online, all the people using Blender are usually using them with default settings uh, or with you know at least default key or input presets so that means when you start using 3ds max presets a lot of the um, like standard uh, keyboard shortcuts and in blender keyboard shortcuts are really important get changed so yeah it kind of makes it harder to learn blender 
So while this selecting with a right click might be super weird in the beginning, um, honestly, if you just use Blender for about two weeks and use it a couple of hours or you know at least an hour each day, just sit yourself down and say, hey, I'm gonna learn this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get used to this, then before you know it, it's really not that bad. Um, it definitely has it, its, its advantages. And I don't mind using it this way. Um, also because switch, swapping left and right changes a lot of things when you're selecting, when you're doing like border selections or um, yeah, just general uh, editing of polygons and selecting things. And it, it really is a pain in the ass when you're trying to watch a tutorial and everything is swapped around. It's kind of crazy to follow. So I would actually avoid using these presets. While they're, they sound awesome in theory, Honestly, learn the Blender presets because, you know, Blender shortcuts, because it's going to really help you out in the long run. Um, you'll be able to pick things up quicker when you're looking at tutorials and things. Uh, there's some interesting features here, though, <clears throat> excuse me, such as um, if you're on a, uh, if you're used to maybe uh, Moto as well, sorry, um, then you could actually go for the trackball orbit style. So if I close this right now, we just have um, we just have the uh, standard turntable orbit style. So you're just used to it. Whatever you grab the screen, this is how you're gonna turn. Um, 3ds Max is like this standard as well. If you're used to something like Moto, then you might be used to trackball style, which um, yeah is just a different way of navigating. If you're pulling on the outside, you're actually able to turn around in different different ways and as you can see if you're not used to it it can be a little disorienting at first now I prefer the max way of doing things so I just leave this to turntable but <clears throat> um, if you want trackball is in there as well then for the um, zoom style and everything that's kind of under here I don't really mess with this anyway uh, I find that the defaults are really similar to max um, and you don't really need to change anything so what are we going to change though for the input? There is one thing that I really would recommend doing um, and that is going to make your life a lot easier. In the 3D view tab, 3D view global, you could actually set um, your viewport navigation to be Mac style. So right now standard Blender viewport navigation is middle mouse click to um, uh, rotate around, shift middle mouse to pan and I can't even remember what the, oh yeah, and control middle mouse to zoom in and out. Now, I find this really hard to get into um, when you're learning new software. I find this to be kind of the, the biggest hurdle and annoyment, I guess, um, when I'm learning new software. And luckily, if you do change it to 3ds Max way of doing things, you're actually not messing with any of the keyboard shortcuts. So that's the one thing I definitely would recommend changing. So change it to the way Max works if that's what you're used to. So for rotate view, alt middle mouse, um, for move, move view, excuse me, uh, just middle mouse and zoom, control alt middle mouse. And that's kind of nice because you only need to, you only have to change these three things and all of a sudden you're working just the same way um, you're working in 3ds Max, which is kind of cool. So I would definitely recommend looking into that as well. So let's go back to the user preferences. And honestly, that's about it. Add-ons, um, Blender comes with a lot of, yeah, they're called add-ons. You can think of them as like plugins or extra little scripts as you would in Max. Um, ships with a bunch of them uh, on default, but a lot of them aren't uh, enabled. Usually they're kind of, you know, um, I guess very uh, case specific and they're not really that uh, important to the basic use of Blender, but there's a lot of cool extra stuff in here. Um, I suggest taking your time and, and having a look at them. And just at the, off the top of my head, Ivy Gen is a cool one. Everybody knows the, the Ivy generator for 3ds Max. This simulates that kind of um, Ivy generator type thing in Blender. Um, this one called Sapling is a basic tree generator in Blender. So that's pretty cool as well if you wanna get into making trees. Um, Blender is another tool able to do so. Then uh, let's have a look. There's a lot of stuff in here. Different formats, so it, the AutoCAD DXF format, for example, if you're used to importing that a lot, you can turn this on and then uh, make it work. Like I said, there's a whole, a whole lot of stuff in here that um, that isn't enabled by default. 
Uh, the Make Human one, for example, is there's this open source application called Make Human, which is great for very basic um, skinned human meshes. Um, so, you know, if you want to mess around with that kind of stuff, if you want to import their files, you can just enable it. And all it is is just literally clicking this and then it's enabled. Um, another cool one is the Nuke animation format. So .chan files, uh, if you're bringing like camera data from Nuke into Blender, you definitely want to uh, put that, uh, turn that on. It's a good format to work with as well. Um, B surfaces is also a really cool way of modeling. Uh, you can definitely turn that on. There's some extra loop tools here in here, uh, which emulate, I guess, um, some of the graphite modeling tool stuff but very basic uh, from 3ds Max as well. You've got a cell fracture, uh, cell fracture, which is just a fracturing plugin. Um, it's very basic, but it works well. So you, if you're doing VFX and you want to try Blender out for that, you could use that as well. Um, there's another one here called Node Wrangler. I would definitely enable that um, as you're getting into, uh, I guess, um, shading and things like that and using nodes and blender excuse me um it's one of the one of the better little plugins in there uh it's really really awesome we'll get into that uh i'll get into that when i start doing things on cycles and basic you know basic how to use cycles things like that and using nodes one i would definitely recommend um switching on is the auto tile size plugin or add-on sorry um basically what this does uh, it says estimate and set the tile cells that will render the fastest. Blender cycles render um, is, uh, depending on if you're using GPU or CPU, is very, I guess, um, sensitive to the tile size of what you're rendering with. And it would actually improve your, uh, your speed quite a bit if you set it correctly. And auto tile size actually kind of does that for you. And it works quite well. Um, but yeah, that's just a couple of them. You've got some pie menus in here as well. Uh, if you're used to using that in like Maya or whatever, I would definitely have a look at them. All of these things have documentation as well. Let's open this with Chrome and move that in here. So this is just like kind of a preview of what those pie menus look like. Um, if you like that kind of stuff, definitely have a look at it. It's uh, yeah, it's definitely a cool, cool little add on. So let's move on. Let's go back to the top here and go to themes. Now, this is a lot of fun. <laughs> I won't, you know, I won't lie. 3ds Max is either light gray or dark gray, and you know, uh, you either like one or the other. In Blender, you've got a lot of themes you can work with, and it's a lot of fun, actually. You can mess around with them. This 3ds Max one, you might be tempted to use that one, but it emulates like the light 3ds Max, and I'm really not into that. I prefer kind of a darker user interface. Um, if you ever want to go back to the default theme, it's not actually in here. You have to just hit reset to default theme and then it'll reset. Um, some of the ones I like are the Elysian theme or um, the one I usually use is the graph theme. I kind of like it, it gives a nice balance of having kind of a darker interface. Um, it's easier on the eyes, I guess. Um, and usually if you're gonna see me do videos on Blender, I'll be using this graph theme as well. So I'm gonna leave it, set it to that for now. Um, then in the file uh, preferences, there are actually some cool things in here. One thing you might want to change is your temporary directory. Uh, I have like a where are we? A temporary Blender folder, which I'll just put in here. Um, and you can change pretty much anything for basics. I guess it's like the system and user paths you have in 3ds Max. So if you're used to messing around with those, um, you can do that in Blender as well. Then one thing to keep in mind is this auto run Python scripts um, checkbox. Uh, for some, um, I guess for some add-ons you need these, uh, you need this enabled. I usually disable it because most of the uh, add-ons that need it will tell you when you need it and they will actually just tell you where it is and how to enable it. Some other little things, uh, the autosave thing is in here. This might be a little weird to autosave temporary files every two minutes, but um, Blender does this very unobtrusively and I find it works quite well. You don't get a, a, as much of a system lockup as you would in 3ds Max. With heavy files though, um, you know you might notice it a little bit, so at least you know it's in the uh, file preferences tab. 
Then um, another interesting thing is you can set to load user interface when loading blend files. So if somebody has their own interface they were working with, so a different layout, they might have changed some of the views, like they have a second 3D view or other things like that, then um, it, uh, it will load up with it. If you don't like that, if you have your own kind of start file set, look at that later and you want to overwrite it uh, with your own thing, you can turn this off. It doesn't really bother me that much, to be honest, so I leave it on. And then for the system, we're actually at the last little tab here. Um, this is a really, really nice feature. Uh, I was hoping to have high DPI support in 3ds Max 2016. Now, I know the back end of Max is kind of older, um, so I know it's really not an easy task to do it. And I, obviously, I don't blame the developers at all. Um, they're doing a good job in getting, getting newer versions out there and working on it. Um, if you have a high DPI monitor, though, this is awesome. Um, not only can you set the virtual virtual pixel mode to be either double or native, so it kind of goes crazy here. Um, you can also set the DPI uh, of your windows. So I like turning this down a little bit because you actually get a lot more screen real estate from just that little bit. Even on an... Uh, you know, I'm using a 1920 by 1200 monitor. Uh, it really does make a difference. I can still read everything and it looks fine, but I just get this feeling of space, I guess. Uh, I'm just gonna move this up a bit so we get rid of that text. Um, I just get that feeling of space, which I like. Uh, I think the 3ds Max interface, every year they've started adding more and more things to it, and it's starting to feel a little cluttered. And it's kind of cool that, you know, you've got the option in Blender to kind of work a lot more open and a lot more, you know, with a lot more unobtrusive interface. I like that. And especially this DPI thing for high DPI uh, monitors or non high DPI monitors, you can really set it to be the, the interface to be as big or as small as you want it to be. And I think that's a really cool feature. Um, so, you know, definitely check that out. Then this compute device tab, I'm not going to go over the other stuff here. Um, this is just some basic things for uh, what is it? Here we have some sound playback things. I've found that the the um, defaults work just fine, so I don't really mess with it. We've also got built-in screen screencast functionality for Blender, so if you want to um, make a video on Blender or whatever, you can do it with built-in some built-in tools, which is cool. But I like to use other stuff. Um, but hey, you know it's in there, so it's awesome. And then for the compute device, um, we'll get back to this in a little bit. Um, you've got either a CUDA option or a none option. Um, I believe since the latest version of Blender uh, 2.75 is when I recorded this. Uh, they've got experimental support for AMD cards as well, which is cool. And this is all about uh, rendering on your GPU with cycles, um, which we'll get into once we get into the cycles part of this tutorial. Then um, for the last part here, for the last bit, there's not really much I can change. <coughs> Excuse me, not much I, I want to change. But um, when we go back to this uh, window, we've got actually we've got a T uh, shortcut for the transform or for the tools here, and uh, we've got another one on the side we can open it with N. Um, I just want to show you this. You also have this little region overlap um, option, which is quite nice because it makes these transparent and not as unobtrusive, and it doesn't. Oh, sorry about that. And it doesn't change your um, field of view, so I kind of like that. Uh, I usually I'm usually turning this these on and off a lot. As I said, I like to work in kind of a I guess a Spartan interface with not too much stuff going on, especially when it comes to the 3D viewport. So it's nice nice that these aren't as obtrusive and um, you can kind of hide you know hide them easily and, and make them transparent, which I find you know it's cool, but it doesn't really matter if you're not into it. Then that's it. Um, obviously you want to anti-alias our text, so leave that set to default. And other than that, I don't really change anything. You can change the interface font, but I actually quite like the font. Um, you can also change the default lighting of the um, 3D view, but yeah, it works just fine for me, so I don't really change anything. Then. Um, <clears throat> One last thing, which you definitely want to do, because I don't know how long we've been talking, it's been a while now. Click Save User Settings when you're done. Because when you close Blender and you open it up again, yeah, 
it won't have saved your settings if you haven't clicked this button. So <laughs> um, after this entire, uh, and you know, you don't want to look at the whole video again, just to look for that one setting that I was talking about, you know, 10 minutes into it or whatever, and you can't remember where it was, just hit save user settings and you should be okay. So before we move on to the, the cycles uh, part, what have we done? Mainly we've kind of made it made it easier on ourselves. Uh, we've mainly just changed a lot of behind, you know, under the hood settings, but we've also changed our 3D view settings. So I'm using alt rot uh, alt middle mouse to rotate, and that is just awesome. Um, changing the 3D view as the only thing uh, will save you a lot of frustration, but at least you're able to navigate quickly and it makes right clicking to select things less of a drag um, because you're able to navigate more quickly. So um, like I said, just bear with it. Um, it is a pain in the ass in the beginning, but bear with it because it does really make a difference. So that's that for this part. So now that we've set up our basic user preferences, um, Let's get into setting up Blender. Uh, Blender's kind of basic scene. Um, you could compare it to the max start uh, file. It works a very similar way. Uh, it's just Blender saves that internally. And um, yeah, it just uses the defaults you set uh, in your scene. Uh, every time it opens up Blender, it'll you know default to, to that scene and you can just start working in your, I guess, preferred startup scene. So I'm starting from a default scene here in Blender. And uh, well, we want to start using the Cycles render. The Blender render is, if you look up here, the Blender render is uh, has been around for a long time. And the Blender developers are really focusing on the Cycles render, seeing that it's a new render. Um, and it's a path tracer, just like V-Ray or Corona, um, or you know, most of the render engines out there. And it's actually very capable. Uh, it can render both on CPU and GPU, and you can switch pretty easily. Uh, and you don't really need to change anything about your uh, materials and other things. So it's a cool way of working. Um, and definitely, to set it up, of course, when you want to start using it, you actually have to change it to Cycles Render. So if I go back to Blender Render, and you keep an eye on the right side of the screen here, if you look at Cycles Render, when I enable it, some of the stuff changes here. Um, and that's exactly what we're going to look at to start with. Um, before we do though, we've set this to cycles, but I kind of want my viewport to emulate uh, the 3ds Max viewport as well. And what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, this transform tab here, I'm going to turn that off because I'm, you know, I don't really. Once you start getting used to opening it up by hitting T, um, then you can hide it by default because you don't really, or you don't really need it that much. Um, yes, the create tools are in there, but if you know the shortcut for the create tools, then you're not really using it all that much in the beginning. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to open the menu on the other side here by hitting N. So the N key again uh, opens and closes that. And what I'm going to do is actually change the lens in the view here. So what you can do is change your viewport's lens to something that resembles 3ds Max a little bit. I like using 70 millimeters. Um, some people might find that too much of a uh, zoomed in lens or a Taylor lens. Um, but I kind of like it. Because um, it gives slight a bit more of a flatter view. If you go back to the basic 35 millimeter lens from Blender, I find that it gives kind of an exaggerated perspective to be working in your viewport in your viewport. So, or 3D view, sorry, rather in Blender. Uh, so I set it to 70 because I like it that way. Um, also, the standard way of doing things in Blender is I think it's set up something like this. Um, if you look at your Y axis. Uh, I kind of like emulating 3ds Max again by moving my y-axis over to this side um, and having the front of my scene coming in from here. Um, this part of the cube actually being the front, again, the same as it is in 3ds Max. So let's have a look at what else we can change here. If we close the end menu, um, I don't necessarily need a camera and a light set up by default. Uh, so again, I'm going to right click this, delete it and hit enter to delete it, uh, hit delete or X and enter to delete it. Same with the cube, I don't really need anything in my scene to begin with, um, so delete, yes, and uh, there we are. So this is starting to look a little bit more like what you would see in 3ds Max when you start up. Um, 
One important thing to mention though, is that by default, Blender's uh, units are actually set to um, just Blender units, so they're internal units. But what I like to do is actually set them to metric. And, um, you know, the default uh, rotation as well for, well, the default values for rotation, I just leave them at, in degrees because I prefer working with degrees as well. Um, so definitely uh, setting these to metric is a good idea. Now, the only thing that is different um, is you'll see up here that the metric units in Blender are actually set to meters. So if you're used to working with centimeters in um, in 3ds Max, you actually have to divide everything uh, when you're typing in units. And now in the beginning, this might kind of seem like a pain in the ass, but honestly, you get used to it, so it's not that bad. The only thing I do change though is um, if we go back to display here, you can actually change the grid as well. Only thing is, these uh, this grid scale is set to one, so that means every single um, grid, uh, yeah, I guess division here is one meter. Um, so that means if we have 16 lines here, so that's 8 meters um, from the origin, again 8 meters here, and uh, I find that to be a little big, especially when I'm working uh, with basic things or I just want to model one single object, uh, one single object, sorry. So what I do is I set my scale to 0.1, zoom in a little bit, and that way I know each single subdivision is 10 centimeters, uh, and then if I set my lines to 20, I know I have one meter starting from the origin going this way, uh, going this way, that way, and that way. So I prefer that, um, and it's definitely something to look into uh, because when I started modeling first, I didn't really look at the meters and I uh, didn't, re didn't realize it, and I was making chairs that were the size of houses and things like that. So um, definitely something to look into. Is it annoying that you can't set it to centimeters? Yeah, kind of. Um, do you get used to it? Yeah. So. In the end, it doesn't really matter that much. So again, hit the end key to close that. And this is something, you know, this kind of more resembles what I'm used to in 3ds Max, knowing that these are uh, 10 centimeters each. And um, yeah, I can start working this way. So um, let's save that already to start with before we start diving into the cycle stuff. Um, how do you do this? Save startup file. Just make sure when you click it to click again, because um, there's a double confirmation here. And that's it. So if I close Blender to start with, yep, and I open it again, you'll see uh, that my window is maximized as I had it before. My uh, grid is set up the way I want. The front of the, you know, I guess same same way 3ds Max is set up. If you look at the front of the scene, is pointing this way. Um, and yeah, it's very similar now. So you can start working away without too much trouble. Also notice that the cycles render as we had enabled it is enabled as well. So um, let's set, uh, let's get into setting basic cycle settings in the next part. So for the next part of this tutorial, um, where I'm just going to be talking about some default cycle settings, uh, I've actually prepared this little scene um, just so I can show you what the default settings are and why I'm setting these up the way I am. It's just, you know, four, four objects with each uh, different material, one kind of plasticky, one um, kind of colored glassy, uh, a chrome metalish one, and an emission shader. Just to give you an idea of, of some of the settings and we can see it happening in real time. Now, before I get into that, when you go to viewport shading down here, you can just set your 3D view to be rendered, and then it will actually just use start using cycles immediately. Um, and you can see a final version of your render. Now, um, if you want to start rendering uh, once you're done, and let's say you hit render up here, uh, it, which is to render a still. So you've got either render, animation, or audio. So this is for rendering a still, for rendering animation, and for rendering the audio only. Um, if you hit render, What's going to happen is your 3D viewport is going to disappear and uh, the render will be there uh, instead. Now I kind of like having the render in a separate uh, separate window just like in 3ds Max. So I'm just going to hit escape here and go back. And the way to do that is in display, you can go to uh, new window. And if I hit render again now, you'll see it'll show up in a new window. Now, um, 
one thing to keep in mind, and that's what this little lock is for on, on the side, is if your viewport is kind of trying to path trace everything that's going on in here, and you hit render while it's doing that, as you can see, it'll keep doing that. So it'll start fighting the render for resources. And obviously, you want to get, um, you want to make sure that you don't have stuff like that happening in the background. So what you can do is just hit this lock button. Now, if I move this again and hit render quickly, you'll see it just locks the entire thing, and it'll only start rendering again once the render here is done. So that was maybe a bit quick to see, but you know the theory behind it is that you um, you actually lock your interface, and as it says. Uh, you're locked in face during render in favor of giving more memory to the render. So um, you're not, you know, making the render fight with itself in the viewport, which is a good thing to keep in mind when you're, um, yeah, when you're using the interactive viewport and you hit render. So um, we're not going to go over too much here. You've got either experimental or supported when it comes to feature set. Just use supported. Um, on the CPU, it supports pretty much everything uh, in the render. On the GPU, one or two features are still experimental. But if you're really doing that kind of work, then you will find that out by yourself uh, when you start looking it up. So you'll know when to switch. Then you can choose between GPU or CPU. As you can see, it instantly starts uh, rendering on the GPU now. If you don't see the GPU option, make sure to go back to your um, user preferences and in system, I'll open this up a little bit, uh, you've got the compute device and that's exactly meant for uh, the GPU compute and cycles. I've got a 980 in here. Um, the experimental support for AMD cards has started in this version that I'm using actually, it's 2.75. Um, but they've supported CUDA cards uh, for a long time now, and it's known to work quite well. And it is very, very fast when you render on the GPU. Um, it's kind of kind of fun to work with. Uh, but it's cool to have that option to switch between two. Again, if you choose your card and you set it to CUDA, save your user settings before you, um, before you close the window and close Blender. Otherwise, you'll have to do it every time you start up. Um, so I'm going to leave this on GPU compute for now, seeing that it's pretty quick. Uh, and let's move on. So render presets, just basic presets. We're not going to look into the dimensions and the frame rate. Um, this is obviously something that you um, you know that you'll decide for yourself. Uh, I just leave these at the default usually. I don't mind it. One thing to note is the 50% slider here. If I hit render, um, I've got a 1920 by 1200 screen so you can see, it's uh, not rendering the full size, it's only rendering half size as the 50% says here. So that's very nice for previews. You don't have to change the um, different resolutions here. You can just change the preview size and then, um, you know, that's it. Obviously, if you want to render the full resolution, set it to 100% and let it render. Now, and leave this to about 67 or something for now. That's about 720p as well, it's an equivalent. Um, one thing that's interesting is when you go to the border and crop um, is that you'll actually in your viewport only render what your camera sees so this might be nice uh, if you're experiencing some issues or if your viewport uh, is set like this and you don't want to be rendering everything else especially in heavy scenes it could be used to, it's nice to um, use these options to kind of crop it out a little bit um, and let's move on. The metadata is kind of cool. You don't actually see that in the viewport as far as I know. If we go back to our camera, no. Um, if I hit render now, and once we're done rendering, it'll add some stamp, stamp, uh, stamped information on the image. So that's good for like dailies or sharing things with other people. Um, definitely nice that it's in there. I leave it off by default, but it's good to know that it's in there. Then for the output as well, um, depending on what um, I guess what format you usually use, you can set this to be something default. I usually render to OpenEXR um, and to half float because it's a little smaller and you don't really need the, the full 32-bit information for most of the color information. Um, but again, yeah, this is all set, uh, set for your preference. You could even set a default render directory if you really um, want it to be somewhere, uh, yeah, somewhere specific every time you start a new scene. Then freestyle is a um, line renderer, which I don't really use, so 
again, leave it off by default. So it's kind of like contours in Mental Ray, um, or like ink and paint type stuff in 3ds Max in general. Then the one thing that is interesting to have a look at is um, our samples here. This is the basic settings for uh, the quality. Um, this is kind of what you're going to tell uh, cycles to do. It's kind of like uh, passes in Corona. For example, you just tell it to uh, refine the image and keep refining the image. So we've got two settings here, which is nice. One is the preview, and that uh, is the viewport setting here. So if we just change the preview, let's say change this up to 64, you'll see that it'll keep refining until it hits those samples up here. I can change that you know, very high if I want to. But again, it's not always needed to like tax the um, tax your video card if you're running on the GPU the entire time. Like every time you move your your preview, it's gonna start running through and running through and you know it's just rendering and rendering and rendering. For your preview, keep it fairly low. Um, you know, I find it to be like like 10 or 16 or 32 um, samples is usually more than enough to get an idea of what the final scene looks like. Um, Again, render is for your final render, so if you crank that up and render it, then you'll see that it will keep sampling until it hits that ceiling. And we don't really need the, the full render here. It's just to show you that there's a difference between the two. So it's nice you can keep those separated and don't always have to change the um, render setting again and again when you're working with the preview. Um, another really interesting thing is the seed values. So Corona has this disabled by default as well. Um, V-Ray doesn't, I believe, although don't quote me on that, I'm not 100% sure. Um, this is very interesting to turn on by default, especially if you're doing animations. So you get a different noise pattern for every frame rendered. Now, um, if you leave this off, it can reduce some of the noise in animations, but you get some like weird patterns in your images sometimes. I like using noise reduction software afterwards. So um, again, this seed value, uh, if you have a different noise pattern at every frame, especially for animations, is a really good idea to turn on if you have a very heavy post-production workflow. So then if we go down to volume sampling, I don't really change anything. Um, volumes usually look pretty good out of the box, although you have to enable one thing, and that's why, why I'm going over to the light paths. So you have to make sure we have um, a volumetric uh, and, um, and some bounces when it comes to volumetric stuff. So if you set these to like 10, um, I usually set these default to 10. One does a trick for basic volumetrics um, just to see what's going on. But if this is set to zero, uh, by default it's set to zero as well, then let's say you're rendering smoke in cycles, um, you're gonna get just black smoke. Nothing's gonna happen with it. It's gonna look really weird. And that's because the global illumination isn't bouncing around in it, which gives it the kind of normal smoke look um, with some volume to it. So I like to set that to 10, so I don't have to worry about it and change it every single time I start using volumetrics. Um, obviously it depends on uh, personal preference. Then motion blur on or off, um, this is very, no bullshit, I guess. Uh, shutter speed and motion blur. Um, yeah, I like it to, to leave it on and then turn it off when I uh, when I notice that like heavier scenes are having a hard time with it. Um, but generally, if you have a simple scene, leave motion. I like to leave motion blur on because it looks a lot better when it's rendered rather than doing it afterwards. Um, then we come to the film tab. This is where you can set your uh, filter type, which Gaussian by default works fine for me. Um, you can change your exposure, but I like to do, I like to keep it set to one. Um, yeah, you can do that afterwards if you're rendering the XRs anyway. Um, and it's generally a better idea to get your lighting right than to keep messing with your exposure. Um, but again, that's everybody's own workflow. So um, depending on what you like, this is where you can change it. One thing to note though, is if you hit the transparent button, you will actually get an alpha channel for everything that is, um, kind of a background, I guess. So this is a very, very important little checkbox. Um, kind of flabbergasts me that it's not enabled by default. Um, it would seem kind of a smarter thing to do, uh, especially if you're rendering uh, different layers and things. It's nice to have that alpha channel. So definitely leave this on for default. And um, yeah, it's always a good idea.
Um, performance, this is where I come back to something. Um, I usually don't mess around with this too much. And the reason for it is if we go back to our user preferences, I talked about um, this little add-on that was called auto tile size and it's down here in the um, render settings. If we look at this, uh, if we turn this off, then what you'll see is auto tile size is disappears here. And uh, if I turn it back on, where is it? I lost it again. It'll automatically, it'll pop up and it'll automatically determine the size of tiles that you're rendering. So if I hit F12, for example, you see we've got these really big tiles um, and they general, big tiles generally render a lot faster on the GPU than smaller ones. Um, why is this auto tile size nice? If I switch to CPU, for example, you'll see it changes it to a smaller tile size um, because the CPU is actually a lot quicker with smaller tiles. So uh, that way you don't have to keep messing with it. I find the you know the performance gain from it is you know pretty good. There's um, uh, I think an article or a tutorial on Blender Guru that explains this. Um, Andrew Price does a really good job of showing it, showing it off. So check that out if you want to check it out. Um, but yeah, it's really nice that to not have to do it um, by hand, does it automatically, looks at the size of your image and kind of defines a, an a, ideal situation um, for you know the aspect and everything. I find it to work really well, so I really like it. That's why I enable it. Um, progressive Refine is what you can turn on to have a, I guess, Corona-like experience um, if you're coming from Max and Corona and Blender with cycles and that it just progressively refines your image. One thing to note though, is that it even says it on the tooltip that it does render a little slower. Um, so it's good for maybe like previewing, but it uses progressive refinement in the viewport anyway. So if I'm previewing and working on shaders and things, I generally just set my preview to um, be the render and then uh, let it refine this way. And then for my final render, just let it compute the way it would and the way it's quicker because um, there's really no point in setting progressive rendering if it's slower, if you can get the same effect within your viewport um, uh, and don't have to hit render every single time. So, And that's about it. The post-processing and bake options I don't really touch because um, I, don't, I don't really use them that much. But yeah, that's kind of an overview of some of the settings I like to change. Um, Obviously, this is not a tutorial that um, you know is going to teach you how to use Blender. But if you're interested in getting into it, coming from 3ds Max, if you set all of this up this a very similar way, then um, it'll feel a lot more familiar when you're working with it. And I think that's one of the biggest hurdles when it comes to learning a new 3D application is you're so used to you know your workflows that you have coming from other applications. And they're not necessarily bad workflows. So some of that, you know, if some of that can be adopted into a new 3D application that you're learning, um, I think it's always a good idea. So yeah, thank you for watching. Again, it's a pretty long tutorial. Uh, thanks for getting through this if, if you made it to the end. And um, yeah, I guess I'll see you next time. And uh, if you have any questions, just hit me up on Twitter or the blog or whatever, and I will happily help you out.